When talking about the phases of incident response, we've covered before the six main phases, right? The preparation, detection, analysis, containment, eradication, recovery, and then documentation or lessons learned. This process is a continuous cycle, right? That's refined over time. So none of these things are going to be static. It's a living document. It's a living process. So every time we have a breach or an incident, we're going to learn something from that and we're going to refine our process. Those lessons learned, once you come to the end of that process, right, we go through preparation, detection, containment, eradication, and so forth, right, we get to the end, the documentation and lessons learned, that helps us identify gaps and increase our preparedness for the next time, right? It'd be nice to say there never will be a next time, but unfortunately, it's not the nature of breaches in today's environment. Most companies have hundreds, if not thousands of breaches or attempted breaches per year. Some companies have thousands per day. It really just depends upon the size of your company, the criticality of the information your company has, or the intellectual property or whatever data that's valuable to a hacker, whoever that hacker or hacking organization may be. And then additional resources are brought online and into that response team's arsenal, right? As I mentioned, it's not a static environment. It's, it's dynamic. And so as we go through this process and we refine, 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 lessons learned, we, we identify gaps, we close those gaps. We may need additional resources, additional team members with additional skill sets. Every company is going to be slightly different. Every company houses different information, has different potential targets for a hacker or a hacking organization. So there is no one set document that will cover everything. There's certainly a guideline and a best practices. But as you go through this, you will identify specific things that are unique to your organization and correct or add to that arsenal accordingly. So when we're talking about preparation, okay, a couple things. We need to make sure that we identify team members. It's very important that we identify what skills we need, how many team members we need, right? One person really can't do all of this. It's too vast. There's too many things to do at once. In the middle of a breach, you're going to have multiple things going on at once, detection and analysis alerting other people, alerting other teams, coordinating with media, coordinating with executive management, actually identifying the risk, shutting down ports, protocols, so on and so forth, right? There's going to be a lot of things that may need to happen concurrently, right, or in tandem in the middle of a breach. So it's really too much for one person to handle typically. So we'll need to identify those team members. We need to identify and define roles and responsibilities. It should be clearly defined who does what and in what order or in the middle of some type of crisis we have a playbook, right, or a run book we can go by and say, okay, you do this, I'll do this, Sally will do that over there, Bob's going, he's going to take care of that piece for us. Everybody works in concert and attacks the problem as a cohesive unit, right? It's very important to have that synergy. And then also develop defense in-depth strategies. These things should be spelled out ahead of time. Shouldn't have just one lock on the door, right? We've talked about it here. We've talked about it in Security Plus. There's many things that we can do so that if a hacker breaches one method of defense, there's still another, perhaps two or three more that they have to get through before they can get into our network and into our systems. So make it as difficult as possible. That also gives you time to become alerted. It gives you time to remediate before they penetrate all of the defenses and get at your critical systems. In the detection and analysis phases, properly trained teams can assist and expedite all phases of the incident and response process, all right? So having that team in place, properly trained, running smooth, that's going to help all phases of that process, all right? So it's important to understand that. So a quick assessment can determine the level of impact and also help direct containment and mitigation efforts. So that quick initial assessment, is this malware or is it not? Is this a virus? Is this a hacking attempt that came in through maybe a specific port or a protocol, or they did some type of SQL injection, or they had a USB stick that was infected and brought into our system, or it was an infected laptop or, or what have you. By identifying the source and the type of threat, the type of, of incident we're dealing with here, can help quickly identify the level of impact. Is it going to be a nuisance or is it going to be a multi-million dollar event? Are we going to lose customer information, right? How quickly can we stem that bleeding? That helps direct containment and the mitigation efforts. Also, analysis of event files, log files, from things like intrusion detection systems, firewalls, routers, switches, directory servers, et cetera, et cetera. Anything on our network that can be audited or that creates log files that can be parsed and then correlated across different verticals, right? We can correlate timing and so forth from our routers and switches, our firewalls, IDS systems, access to directory servers, or perhaps pieces of critical infrastructure. If we're able to aggregate and then correlate those events across all those devices at one time, it allows us to quickly get a picture of what's happening, right, and how it's happening. So all of those network systems should be brought into play. That helps us determine the true intent 
of that attack. So is your company the clear target? In other words, are you the goal or is someone just probing? They happen to come across one of your systems and they're just probing just to see what's there, right? It's the old hacker mantra. Well, why'd you climb that mountain? Well, because it was there. Sometimes people just want to probe and see what they can see. They don't have a specific goal. They're not trying to necessarily steal something or destroy something. They just want to see if they can get in more or less as a badge of, of honor, if you will. Alternatively, was your business the actual target or are you a side door attack to some other company? And as I mentioned earlier, as far as things being a clear target or just probing, was this a true attack or just someone doing an initial network or a resource mapping? They want to come in and probe our network and see how things are laid out. What are our routers and switches? Do we have a single namespace? Do we have different IP spaces for different areas? Naming conventions, what type of systems do we have? Are we running Linux, Windows, virtualization, so forth, right? So by coming in and doing that network mapping, they can get a good idea of what types of systems are on the network. So by having that properly trained team, we can identify and say, okay, is this a breach? Are we really in all hands on deck mode? And we have to go in and start uh, bringing all of our resources to bear to try to confront this and contain it. Or was this someone coming in initially? Did we catch them in the very beginning, hopefully, while they're still doing a network scan, trying to go in and see what there is of value? So by being able to identify that, it allows us to quickly attack that in the proper fashion, assign resources correctly, and address that threat appropriately. Now, when it comes to stopping the spread, we want to focus on a couple things. Containment. All right, so containing a security incident is going to help mitigate loss. As I mentioned, the quicker we can contain that spread or that initial infection of that piece of malware or virus or whatever the case might be, focusing on malware here, the quicker we can contain that, the quicker we can mitigate loss. We can kind of stem the bleeding, if you will. So after containment, then comes eradication. So eradication, it may consist of actually disabling compromised accounts, taking that machine out of service, obviously. Also, potentially wiping that machine and reinstalling from scratch. It all depends upon, you know, that part of the recovery process that deals with backups, right? If we have valid backups and we can identify them or verify them rather as being valid backups, then we may be able to restore that system from that backed up piece of data, right? That backup tape or what have you. If it's not, however, then we may need to completely blow that system away or wipe that system or re-image that system. Also check it for root kits and things along those lines because we want to make sure that that system is not compromised beyond what we initially thought. So when it comes to eradication and recovery, a few things I talked about, we may need to disable affected accounts, right? We have to identify how that piece of malware was installed, what user account was used. Is it affecting admin accounts? Is our system set up or is our network set up to have admin accounts disabled by default? Right? If there's a service account that it somehow is able to attach itself to and then spread throughout the network using that service account, we have to identify that quickly and disable that account so it can't spread. All right? So it just depends upon the nature of that piece of malware. Next, we have to identify what ports and protocols that piece of malware uses. And as I'm sure you're guessing, shut down those ports and protocols or at least monitor them very closely to make sure that malware is not spreading to other systems across that same transport mechanism, right? that same port or that same protocol. Next, recover from backup, as I mentioned. We'll verify that the backup is in fact good. If it's not, then we need to do a fresh install. Right? It's going to depend upon, again, the nature of that infection. And then something else that's equally as important, if not more important, and we have to do that very quickly, kind of in tandem with the initial infection as we're going through our identification and remediation steps, we need to coordinate with other sites and other locations within our company to make sure they're aware of the breach of the infection and so they can start monitoring their systems as well so that if a spread in fact does take place or tries to take place, they can mitigate that as quickly as possible. And again, that goes back to what I said earlier about what accounts are being used, what ports or protocols and so forth. So that information should be shared with other sites and with other locations within the company. Music